Hare Krishna. So in um, this discussion, we are going to basically talk about the three temptations of Jesus. This is again continuing on the theme of Christmas um, and celebrating this wonderful occasion. Um, so as, as we all know, the, the Gospels in the New Testament of the Bible, they describe the life of Jesus. And there's this wonderful, um, uh, very, very famous uh, Western novelist, uh, Tolstoy, who has written this spiritually elevating commentary to this, uh, to this, uh, to the Gospels. Conversation of the, of the three temptations of Jesus, the conversation between Jesus and Satan, which caught my attention. I thought for this occasion, it's, it's just fantastic that all of us hear this and try to contemplate on what this, this historic uh, discussion has in store for us. And interestingly, as we read it, we'll find the parallels that the teachings of Jesus in this conversation with Satan has to the teachings of Krishna in the Gita. <laughs> so it's, it's just pretty parallel like that. So the story begins in, uh, in, in a very nice way that Jesus uh, went to the, uh, to the desert and he's doing this 40 days and 40 nights of fasting to see the Almighty Lord. And <clears throat> he's completely hungry, completely thirsty, hasn't had a drop of water, hasn't eaten anything. And as he's fasting and beseeching the Lord to appear, the personality who appears instead of the Lord is the Satan, the evil, the devil. And the conversation is very interesting. Satan looks at Jesus and he says that if you're really the son of God, there's a stone in front of Jesus. He says, if you're really the son of God and you're hungry for 40 days, you haven't eaten anything, by the power of you being the son of God, turn this stone into bread. To which Jesus says the famous man can't live on bread alone. You know, that's, that's a famous saying from the gospel. So Jesus says, you know, I'm hungry. And, you know, even if I can convert this to bread, but man can live on bread alone. So what are you trying to prove? <laughs> so that's the first temptation. The second temptation to that Satan says, you know, the scene is that Jesus is on, on top of a tower. And Satan says that if you're actually the son of God, you know, if you fall down from this tower, or if you're thrown down from the, the top of this tower, then you should just depend on that mysterious power to protect you. You shouldn't worry. To which again, <laughs> Jesus says, thou shall not tempt God. Don't try to empirically test the presence of God. So that's the second temptation. And the third, uh, after all this, Satan says, why do you want to be uh, the son of God and, and serve God as, uh, as a servant? as somebody who is uh, taking a subordinate position. Just bow down to me. And instead of being subordinate there, you can be a king here. Like, you just bow down to me, accept me as your authority, and you can live on earth as a king. So basically, Satan is trying to convince Jesus, why do you want to be a servant in heaven when you can be the king on earth? Yeah, so to that also, Jesus gives a very um, befitting reply where he says, I am the son of God, so I depend on him, and I serve him, and I take rewards from him, not from you. So that those are the three temptations that uh, we find. Uh, and after this, Satan leaves. Uh, he disappears, seeing the, the one-pointed determination of Jesus. So these temptations couldn't tempt Jesus enough. Now, and this is the overall picture. Now we'll dive deep inside to the, the commentary of Tolstoy and the parallels with the Gita and see how these temptations are connected to one another and what do they actually mean to us. So basically, this is considered, uh, Tolstoy in his commentary, he writes that this is basically the conversation between the, the son of God and the son of flesh. So basically, that's the first principle, the teaching of the Gita. In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about two natures. He talks about spirit and he talks about flesh. He talks about how we are spirit, but covered by this body, which is flesh. So this conversation between Jesus and Satan is like basically a conversation between uh, son of spirit and son of matter or flesh, and they are conversing. On another, ex on another level, this is also a conversation between the soul and the Satan, that is the mind. <laughs> because the mind always tries to trick, trick you and tempt you away from your spiritual practice. And uh, as far as Jesus being called as the son of God, uh, again we find a parallel in the Gita, where it is said that this spiritual spark is the sun. Uh, um, the, the Sanskrit is Amrita Swa Putra, which means Putra means sun, and Amrita means nectar. So basically, all the living entities are called as sons of that immortal nectar, that is God. And God is called as Aham Bija Pradapita, I am the seed giving father. So again, we find the parallel of how the spirit is very nicely seen as the son of God. So now let's start analyzing the first temptation. 
So the first question, as we saw, uh, Satan comes to Jesus and he says that if you're actually the son of God, you should, you should be able to prove that by making this stone into bread. So what he was trying to say is that, oh, you're performing so much of austerity to get God. But if you're actually son of God, you should be so spiritually powerful that you should be able to control your hunger. And but still, if you're able to, if you're still feeling hungry, by the power of your spiritual connection with God, try making that stone into bread so that you can eat that bread and you don't have to fast for 40 days. But to that, uh, very wonderfully, Jesus says that I am not the son in flesh, but in spirit alone. Which means here, Lord Jesus says that I am the son of God in spirit, right? What is stone? It is matter. What is bread? That is matter. And what to speak of this body? Flesh. That is matter. Converting one matter into another matter, how does that prove that I have a spiritual connection? <laughs> so it's like a fantastic reply that Jesus gives here, crushing the question of Satan by clearly giving the distinction between spirit and matter. He says, if I have a spiritual connection with God, how is that proven by converting one matter into another matter that is stone into bread with the help of one matter, that's body. So what are you trying to prove? <laughs> I am not this body. I am spiritual spark. And that's the connection. So Jesus says, I am not the son in flesh, but in spirit alone. Because if I was son in flesh, you could say, well, convert one matter into another with this matter and prove your, your, uh, your connection. But very wonderfully, Jesus says, I am not the son in flesh, but in spirit alone. So he's very, very beautifully um, just, just crushing uh, Satan's question, so to speak with this, uh, this concept of uh, distinction between spirit and matter. Tolstoy writes here that Satan tries to rebuttal by saying, okay, if you're the son in, uh, you, you are the son of God in spirit and not in flesh, then go up, go up the tower, jump from there. You are not the son in flesh, so the flesh will get destroyed, but you are the son in spirit, so nothing should happen to you, right? So that's the common thread. He says that, okay, I understand. If you're saying you, you don't want to convert the stone into bread, because you're not the son in flesh, but you're son in spirit. Okay, now walk up to the tower and jump from there. And because you are the son, not in flesh, but in spirit, nothing should happen to you. And you should be protected by that mysterious power. To that, Jesus very wonderfully replies uh, in, in humility. He says that I am the son in spirit. And by the will of my father, that spirit is placed in the sacred body. So therefore, this is the arrangement of my father and to keep up to that word and respect his plan is my duty. I cannot just give up this body because it's his plan that the soul should be in this body. So I, I don't want to give it up. So this, this runs parallel to the, the Vedic text, the Indian uh, wisdom text. Uh, there's a text called as the nectar of devotion, which talks about a principle called as yukta vairagya, which means on the path of spiritual elevation or culture, you give up things which are unnecessary and accept things which are necessary for you to achieve your goal. It doesn't mean you give up everything that's material. So here, Jesus is actually talking about that. Satan is trying to tell him, oh, you are the son in spirit, not in flesh. Give up everything that's flesh. But Jesus says, no. This body is like a gift from God. I am the son of God, and I am placed in this body by his will. So in humility, I must respect that plan. So I'm good. <laughs> so to this... Uh, the, the common thread now ties that to the third temptation. And to that, uh, Satan uh, says, uh, this is the point where Satan says, bow down to me. Um, you know, I shall make you the king in, on earth. Why do you want to be the servant in heaven? So, so the common thread to that is, Satan now, in, in a very evil way, tries to tell Jesus, okay, everything is the Lord's plan. So even enjoying this body, which is a gift from God, is an act of humility. Because this God is his gift, this, this body is God's gift, and to maintain that is humility. So you should also take care of the different desires and the different temptations of this body. That's also your duty. <laughs> so it's like our mind trying to trick us when we're meditating that, oh, you should actually enjoy the pleasures of this body. This body is given to you by God. So it's basically an yeah. uh, evil thought. So to that, Jesus very wonderfully uh, uh, responds. In fact, it said even before he responds, uh, Satan gives Jesus uh, a view, overview, of how people who bow down to him are actually enjoying in flesh, in this material world. So Jesus sees that, but he doesn't feel, oh, I'm missing on something, because he's fixed in his spiritual path. So to that, he tells Satan that, um, I wouldn't bow down to you because I am spirit, 
spirit belongs to God. I align myself to his plan and from him I shall accept rewards, not from you. Because I belong to him, I accept rewards and pleasures only from him, not from you. <laughs> and when Jesus says that uh, very strongly and, and, and very uh, sincerely, immediately it said all the temptations are ceased and Satan disappears. So this is very instructive that on the path of meditation, the mind can try to take us astray. The, the Bhagavad Gita again, on a parallel to this, it says that that mind which is well controlled by the practitioner, that mind is the practitioner's best friend because it helps one on the practice of meditation. But that mind, which acts like Satan and which is uncontrolled, oh, in the life of the practitioner, that mind is one's greatest enemy because it's trying to take us away from our goal, from our path of meditation and trance by giving us temporary flesh-like temptations. So it's our duty, just like Jesus, very strictly and very firmly cut all of this uh, to pieces. It's our duty that we control the, the fluctuations and the, the unnecessary uh, swings, so to speak, on the, on the mental platform. And we focus with attention, with sincerity, with seriousness on the goal of our practice. And then, finally, when that happens, all the Satan-like temptations would cease and a, a person would become joyful uh, on the practice that he is a part of. Just like Jesus felt supreme bliss. It said, <clears throat> after this, he came out of desert and met with John. And the story continues. So no more Satan after that. Because the Satan tried his best to tempt Jesus. But when Jesus was fixed on his principles, in complete humility and dependence on the grace of God, then all these temptations ceased.